Through patience, man possesses his soul. In our daily walk with our Lord Jesus Christ, we will encounter difficulty and evil, and in fact, Christ promised we would. Yet the Christian is called to endure, but not only to endure externally, to do so with patience, never giving up the peace that our Lord gives us. That's what we're talking about today on episode 19 of Deep in Christ. Hello and welcome back to Deep in Christ. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here at the Coming Home Network International, sharing with you another conversation about the daily task of growing deeper in imitation of and relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you again for being here and for being part of this discussion. In fact, if you're a convert to Catholicism or someone considering becoming or returning to the Catholic Church and you'd like to go deeper in this discussion about going deep in Christ, I'd encourage you to head over to community.chnetwork.org where you can subscribe to new episodes and updates about this show, as well as discuss it with Father Peter and I and other members of the Coming Home Network International who may be on a similar journey as you are. And we'd love to have you over there. So check that out. Now, last week, Father Peter and I continued our discussion on fortitude, this essential cardinal human virtue, this habit of being ready to die if it be necessary to see that justice is done and the good realized. We talked about how fortitude or courage must not rely on itself, as Joseph Pieper writes. We must be people of prudence, that is, people who are radically committed to reality, to reason, to the prayerful discernment of the will of God in our lives, and finally, indeed, to the the bold realization of God's will, even and especially when we encounter difficulty. Today we're talking about the first of two primary aspects of fortitude, endurance and the closely connected sub-virtue of patience. We had a good discussion, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's dive in. At the beginning of this chapter, so we know we're moving on this week to this chapter of Peepers on the endurance and the attack, but I love actually the beginning of this chapter has this great summary, I think, of what we've talked about thus far in terms of the virtue of fortitude, but also gets at precisely what we're talking about here. So this is the beginning of that chapter three. He writes, to be brave is not the same as to have no fear. Indeed, fortitude actually rules out a certain kind of fearlessness, namely the sort of fearlessness that is based upon a false appraisal and evaluation of reality. Such fearlessness is either blind and deaf to real danger, or else it is the result of a perversion of love. For fear and love depend upon each other. A person who does not love does not fear either, and he who loves falsely fears falsely. One who has lost the will to live does not fear death, but this indifference to life is far removed from genuine fortitude. It is indeed an inversion of the natural order. Fortitude recognize, recognizes, acknowledges, and maintains the natural order of things. The brave man is not deluded. He sees that the injury he suffers is an evil. He does not undervalue and falsify reality. He likes the taste of reality as it is, real. He does not love death, nor does he despise life. Fortitude presupposes in a certain sense that man is afraid of evil. Its essence lies not in knowing no fear, but in not allowing oneself to be forced into evil by fear or to be kept by fear from the realization of the good. I like that last sentence. In fact, it was the last thing I underlined here. Yeah. Um, because it gets to the two different ways that we can we can uh, allow ourselves to be motivated by the fear instead of facing the fear. And, 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 and in being motivated by the fear can allow ourselves to fall into moral uh, disrepute because um, there's there's both sides. You know, we sometimes think of the opposite of courage as being uh, like cowardice in the sense of basically refusing to to act. Mm-hmm. But there's also a form of cowardice or at least a form of non-bravery in basically uh, acting too quickly or too you know, sure. ras- irrationally or right. without the proper motivation or not you know, with respect to the yeah. good. Because when someone jumps out and scares you and you punch him in the face, it's right. like, that's not necessarily bravery. No, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. You know, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, if, if, if someone's, yeah, if, if someone, you know, you see someone, um, you know, walking with a gun down the street towards you in a menacing manner and you pull out your gun and shoot him first, that's not bravery. Right, you, know, not, you, yeah. just, you just reacted, you know, you without reacted, thinking. reacted, you know. yeah. Or, or and, and, and there are, there is, it's not even just a matter of kind of, we've, what we've given 
are in a sense kind of like knee jerk reactions. Right. There are definitely like examples that we can give of kind of extended periods of reflection that still base themselves upon bravery. Pre- preemptive. Any preemptive strike. <laughs> right. I mean, like, let's yeah. be honest, like any preemptive strike by, you know, that's not the only form of this, but by it's kind of a good definition or not definition. It's kind of a good example that any yeah. preemptive strike is um, is a reaction of fear and not of bravery, yeah. and and, it, and particularly because it is also a moral, um, a moral morally false, yeah. morally wrong. So, but well, you I know, mean, today we mainly wanted to focus on. Uh, there's this, again this chapter uh, that that Pieper has in his book. This is the third sec, uh, third chapter in the section on fortitude, which we've been talking about, uh, and this chapter is called in, uh, endurance and attack. And today we wanted to mostly focus on that first part, the endurance aspect of it. You know, enduring. Endure, Master Wayne. Endure, you brought up the great Batman <laughs> Sorry, reference. Yeah, yeah. I can't wish I can't, can't remember exactly how it goes. I but, can't remember it either. Yeah. But I feel like Batman is actually a good a good character to consider in this because uh, the endurance and the attack, you know, the patience and the wrath. You mm-hmm. know, there's a bunch of stuff connected to courage here that we're going to talk about that play out in interesting ways in that character, you know, Mm -hmm. where what is true courage? What does it really look like? You know, what is, what is, and we talked about how, you know, martyrdom gives us this acute picture of, um, of fortitude in its most essential, Mm -hmm. uh, context, you Mm -hmm. know, the, the person who, who, they don't deny the goodness of life. They don't deny the evil of death, Mm -hmm. but with a clear eyed vision of those realities, they still, again, uh, for Christ and by the power of Christ, they allow they lay that out in their life. They allow mm-hmm. themselves to be killed. It's really um, it's not even just Batman. It's, I would say it's really any kind of superhero because the unique in, the unique storyline of a superhero yeah. is that they are normally given kind of an inordinate amount of power, right. and so the ability to change things on a level that for most of us is just unable to. So most right. of us, well, most of us, never have to face the choice of getting rid of, rid of a, like a lot of different evil in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, because frankly, we just can't do anything right. about most of it. But they're given kind of this inordinate amount of power, and so you know, getting into Spider Man, right? With great power <laughs> comes great, you know what? So, um, <laughs> so you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But whatever formulation it happens to take in any given Spider Man movie, they always like to switch it around a little bit. Right. But it always comes down to that. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that usually because of that power, then to 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 provide kind of a story arc for that character, yeah. what's usually happening is they're being stuck in situations where they, especially when it comes to like certain characters like Superman. Where because of their natural like inviolability, mm-hmm. they're usually there. Any sort of drama in their character is usually going to have to be the, the question of: Are they going to endure the certain like a certain amount of kind of physical or, emo- or emotional harm? Yeah. You know, they're going to have to do a loss mm-hmm. um, in order to actually a- achieve the, the right good. Yeah. You know, it's never it's never doing it's it shouldn't be and usually isn't presented to those characters as doing an evil in order to achieve a good. That's not what we're talking about here. That's Patently false and patently wrong, right. but it's always of you know the the evil villain. It's it's always the ca- the classic like on this side they have like you know in the Spider Man this yeah. side he's holding up the trolley trolley car with all the kids and on yeah. this side he's holding Mary Jane. Right. You must choose Spider Man. You yeah. know, um, and you know it's it's always in those situations. I mean w- whether they have a, the ability to to actually save them both or not, it it, it comes down to the moral question: Are they able to endure? The loss. Are they able to endure and kind of, in a sense, make the sacrifice of making the right choice, even in the midst of real fear? Right. You know. Yeah. That. That. I mean, you. <laughs> there's actually. There's actually a, a. There's actually a moral question called the trolley car. Trolley yeah. Car yeah question, the famous you know? philosophical. The famous philosophical. Yeah. Bit, yeah. But that's what. That's one of the great things about science fiction or about superhero movies or yeah. fantasy or all great literature is that they they allow us to explore. I mean, we we can read about this in theory, and we will all experience it all in practice on a day-to-day basis. Okay. Literature allows us to go and experience some of the extremes, mm-hmm. those questions before we encounter them. It's one of the reasons I love my kids, you know, reading great literature, watching great movies. That's why I love science fiction, actually, because it yeah. always presents kind of a very, you know, in a sense, unrealistic kind of hypothetical philosophical situation, mm-hmm. especially when you look at something like Star Trek and stuff. Right. They don't always come out with the right answer or anything, but it's always fun because it presents you with that and kind of allows you to try to figure out what What's the right thing right or, or not, not, not always unrealistic sometimes it's, it's sometimes very realistic right. it's just a, it's just a reality that you're not necessarily going to experience until you're I mean. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah before you're ready f- for it mm. you know I mean you're not necessarily going to work for or meet a Mr. Scrooge until uh, maybe later mm. in your life but the children should understand the greediness of greed mm. 
you know, the, the, the dirty, grimy, uh, soul corrupting, uh, element of selfishness, mm-hmm. you know, like, and you, hopefully you don't become that and yeah. hopefully you don't fall prey to that, but you, you can understand it by experiencing it in literature yeah. and to really understand the, the, the goodness of virtue and the, and the vileness sure. of vice. You can, you can experience that a little bit, explore a little bit. It's kind of amazing is that, you know, even just apart from literature, which is always like, you know, it, it's seeking, it's seeking, um, so you can use imagination to come up with those situations because yeah. it's like, well, we, we're not going to encounter those situations in real life. But what's kind of great is that we actually have the lives of the saints, which is like, yeah. oh, this has actually happened. You know, it's <laughs> like this person actually had to face down right. martyrdom, you know, for their, for, um, uh, they actually had to endure martyrdom for the sake of this. You know, we have, I remember as a kid, uh, I was really inspired by that little book of saints that we had. And it was funny. I was always most inspired by like St. the St. Lucy's, and the saint, um, I was very oh, inspired sure, by sure, the Virgin sure. Martyrs because it was always that, it was always kind of that question whether they would kind of give in to like the lusts. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, just make that small, you know, it's like all you have to do is this and you'll preserve your life, you know, this right. this moral, this moral wrong, you know. And so it was always, it was always like that, that moral quandary, you know, for them. And mm-hmm. it's like their, their stories are so great because they always face it with such bravery and, yeah. um, but, you know, real stories. So. Yeah. So let's I mean, let's reposition uh, courage here before we go on to look at uh, its aspects today. So we've been mm. we've t- been talking through the virtues. We spent a lot of time on prudence, which again the mother and mold, the portal to the moral life, uh, and it proceeds uh, to look toward the reality of justice. You know the real relationships we find ourselves in. Um, it, it looks at the, those relationships. It puts them in order. Um, it it uh, it builds that order over time. It deepens that order. Uh, prudence proceeding to justice. And then we've been talking the last couple of weeks about fortitude, you know, and we talked about it's, it, it primarily, it has this readiness to die, this element to it. It, it always uh, reaches down and is connected to our human vulnerability and that even, even our courage, our fortitude in relationship to small mm-hmm. things, apparently small things, um, you know, even just merely cyclical disturbances or, you know, the emotional wounds or things they're all th- small deaths that mm-hmm. we experience or small foreshadowings of death and so our true act of courage in regards to any of these things is, is courage insofar as it's it's a uh, keep it has that that uh, underlying human v- vulnerability in mind it has its roots planted in that um and then we talked also about oh yeah and then but how with that in mind though it uh, courage can't depend on itself it always refers back to prudence and justice for its content to be informed in terms of what am I to do with my life? What what battle is mine to fight? But then it also the Christian, of course, looks at looks to God to give him the strength to be courageous. So that's mm-hmm. where we've come. But today, again, Peeper is is uh, digging more into fear. I mean, we've been talking about fear up to this point today. That. Um, there's a there's a couple primary elements or forms that courage takes, and mm-hmm. there's 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 endurance, and that's what we're going to focus on today, and then attack. Mm-hmm. That in relation, you know, so courage sees that justice is done uh, in term when there's a situation of difficulty, when there's when there's fear, when there's intimidation, when there's a threat, you know, that would prevent me from doing justice. Um, and one of the primary modes that that takes is this enduring of evil to make sure that the good is done. So in the in the realization of the good. Uh, the, the the courageous person endures. One um, distinction that he makes uh, early on in his chapter is just that when we're talking about endurance, we're not talking about a, a merely passive thing. Mm-hmm. You know that you just you're just letting it happen to you. You know, and 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 actually he he sort of asks that question along with Aquinas that mm-hmm. um, he 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 insists that endurance is a more essential to the nature of fortitude. Now, it doesn't mean that attack, the attack aspect is less, but it's just that the the enduring element um, gives more the form. Again, we, we saw in martyrdom. But this endurance is not a passive thing. We're talking about enduring something. We're not talking about just kind of sitting around letting it happen to you. Because that, mm-hmm. that would, hard to be, it would, hard to, it would be hard to see how that would be a, a real virtue if it's just a, a passivity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he, he quotes Aquinas here. Enduring compromises a strong activity of the soul. Namely, a vigorous grasping of and clinging to the good. And only from this stout-hearted activity can the strength to support the physical and spiritual suffering of injury and death be nourished. So it's, it may look from the outside like endurance is merely a, uh, a passive thing, but internally it's a very, very active thing. 
For sure. And I think uh, scripture passages such as like turn the other cheek, I think a lot of people get, including myself, have gotten wrapped up in the past about that of like, well, does that mean we're just supposed to ignore like the dictates of justice? You know, like I was actually thinking about it randomly on the way here. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it had anything to do really, really our conversation. But then all of a sudden, uh, in terms of preparing for our conversation, but all of a sudden I just started, I realized that it was, was actually referentially referentially uh, significant for our conversation. But I was thinking about, I saw the sign and it was, it's always one of those hilarious signs that we have all around of, of a, a lawyer, you know, like a, an injury <laughs> lawyer. And it was like, his name was like Misley or something like hilarious like that. It's like, Misley makes them pay. That's you good know? that it's you like, got him wrong, his name wrong. It's not his name. But that's probably good because you can't sue us then. So there, there you go. go. <laughs> well, no, it was great. It was, it was, it was, it's, it's always might a, make us pay. It might make us pay. Right. <laughs> well, you know, that's what he said. He said, makes them pay. Yeah. So anyway, I was thinking about that and I was thinking like, well, okay, what if, you know, what if uh, someone just like kind of through recklessness, like, you know, hits my car mm-hmm. and uh, like I lose my leg or something, you know, and I'm not able to do my priesthood and in ministry. And I was just thinking like, you know, it, it's always kind of a moral question. Like, is it right to yeah. to seek recompense for things? And like, I don't know in that situation, I don't necessarily know. But but certainly like seeking out justice in our life is not necessarily not 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 a bad thing. You right, know, I mean, right. if, if someone someone kills our cow, it is not wrong to ask him to pay for it. Right. You know, and right. seek damages, you know, in a sense. In fact, you know, you look in the Old Testament and they lay down some pretty specific rules. Yeah. And it's not like Christ is wiping all that away in the sense of just saying like, oh, yeah, like never, never seek justice, you know, mm-hmm. when, when it's done. But um, but what he's getting at to you is when like, you know, someone does kind of an injury where there's, first of all, there's no like apparent, yeah. there's no apparent recompense to be had except basically to seek revenge. Right. In those situations or when there is no ability for you to seek the justice, you know, that would be done. When you have, are powerless in those situations, yeah. then we're faced with a choice. Do we uh, try to seek out, do, do we kind of give in just sort of, let's say, passively out of fear, mm-hmm. um, or do we uh, endure because it's right to endure, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah. do we, and, and that's the difference between in those situations, you know, if, turn the other cheek to kind of grab that, if someone slaps you, you know, or something like that, then it's like there's a difference between you know, fearing their reprisal if you respond to it in different ways. And so then sulking off into the corner and kind of killing them in your mind yeah. versus saying, no, I'm I'm going to refuse to seek, an, uh, to seek or to nurture revenge in my heart. And so to actively endure. Because you're you know, willing their right. good as well. Right. You know, I, 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 someone pointed that out to me. We were having a conversation about... Um, you know, about self-defense and capital punishment, those kinds of mm-hmm. those difficult issues. And someone made the point, you know, if someone's coming to kill you and you physically stop them, well, you've also prevented them from committing a very grave sin, mm-hmm. killing their own soul, you know, mm-hmm. by, by murder, you know. And that's important to mm-hmm. prevent them from committing that sin. Now, again, you don't do it out of revenge. You don't you don't use undue um, undue force and all that. There's all that, you know, but you if you if you really want the best for the this person, you need to try to respond in a way that's you're willing the good of their soul and trying to act for the good of their soul. Peter actually t- talks about that a little bit later on in that chapter. Uh, Thomas Aquinas in his commentary on St. John's Gospel has pointed to the apparent contradiction between this scene, the scene of uh, Christ saying, turn the other cheek. Mm-hmm. He's talking about the, the, the apparent contradiction between Jesus saying, you know, turn the other cheek, but then... Um, when he's struck on the cheek, mm. giving a response, giving a rather biting response, mm. you know, and, and he writes, let's see, uh, Christ did not offer his other cheek, nor Paul either. Uh, he talks about St. Paul later. Thus, to interpret the injunction of the Sermon on the Mount literally is to misunderstand it. This injunction signifies rather the readiness of the soul to bear, if it be necessary, such things and worse without bitterness against the attacker. Mm. This readiness our Lord showed when he gave up his body to be crucified. So, again, the, the endurance of even that evil and the response to it is that the response needs to be from a place of continuing to will the good of that other person without bitterness, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's, it's remaining prudent to say, what's the right response? Always, what's the right response in the situation, you know? And it might be to call them out saying, this is what you're doing is wrong, which is the example he used of Christ and of St. Paul doing that. It's really important to think of when we, when we keep in mind justice for ourselves, um, that, that, it, it can't it can't remain a selfish selfishly motivated thing the yeah. idea is not that like well i need you know 
there, there can't just be the I need to get what's coming to me, right. you know, type of thing about it. That there, there needs to be a, a, in one sense, there can be or should be sort of an ontological, you know, sense of the rightness or wrongness of the world, mm-hmm. you know, of, of kind of <laughs> balancing the scales in the sense of, of saying like, you know, it's actually right for everyone if justice be done yeah. for me, right. you know. Um, now, at the same time, one must be ready to endure when injustice is going to be done to one and understand that, they're, okay, with an evil, uh, an evil that I cannot rectify, an evil that, that you know, I have, we have no power to, to change or something is done, then, yeah, you're ready to endure. Uh, you're ready to endure it without bitterness, as mm-hmm. he says, you know, and that's, that's a, a tough, a very tough thing. But it's helped when one does not it's helped when one does not conceive of the desire for justice to be done for oneself purely in that selfish way. Right. Because that, first of all, that very easily turns into how can I get, you know, as much out of this, you know, situation as possible. I and mean, we can think of situations where it's like, well, it, it's almost a, not unheard of, but it's almost inconceivable mm-hmm. in our day and age, which very much, you know, focuses on sort of a selfishness, selfishness for someone to be injured to seek recompense, but refuse to accept more than what would be perceived as just. Yeah. You know, I mean, most of the time when someone goes to court to take someone else, it's like, how can we get the most possible out of this person? You right. know, and, 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 and it's it's very difficult to think of situations where someone would act, actively refuse more to receive more back in recompense, you know, to say, actually, no, that's too much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's like, but that's what it means to seek out not justice for its own sake, not not because I hate the other person or I just want to get you know the most for myself, but actually say like no, we're trying to kind of balance the scale here. We're trying to seek justice right. for you and for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it's, we talked about this uh, when we were talking about justice, and that it's almost like there can be a different center of gravity for the virtue of justice. Mm. You know, in in prudence, it refers justice back to the ultimate reality, which is God. You know, like the, the reality of things. God is the creator, and He's made this world and the people, and they have this dignity and all that kind of stuff. So justice should be based on those realities. Mm-hmm. But again, apart from prudence, apart from the, from the relationship with God, it's very easy for for justice to become this sort of mockery of justice, which yeah. it's it's this yeah you know, the system of honor and the, these series of of beliefs about who owes what or what I'm owed that's completely dis- disconnected from reality. Mm-hmm. It's all a myth. It's all a fable. It's all just a, a construction of my mind. And certainly nowadays, more and more, we see this in in culture that um, what is owed what rights people have is increasingly just this matter of, well, what can I get? What can I insist that I'm given by society? What can I get people to vote to, <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to make sure that I'm afforded mm-hmm. rather than seeing justice? No, this is something real and objective that we, we ha- go out there and seek. No, what is really owed God? What, what am I actually owed? You know, what are my rights? What are my, what's my dignity as a human person? Where does it come from? What, what is the reality of my relationship uh, to my spouse or to my employer. Those are real things that we go out and discover. We don't make them up. We don't We don't posit them. They're real. We go out and discover mm-hmm. them. And then we try to live according to them. Sure. Yeah. So it's, again, as always, uh, prudence is the is the virtue that always brings us back to reality. You know, when yeah. I'm pra- practicing justice, you know, what's real? You know, not just what I, not just what do I feel like. And so, you know, uh, again, in, th- in this chapter, talking more about uh, fortitude, I mean, one aspect I wanted to make sure that we touched on is just the the subjectivity involved when we get down to the level of fortitude and temperance. You know, with, with, with justice, we really are focusing outward on something objective, the real relationships, the real natures of things that we're trying to act according to. When we get down to the level of fortitude, what it means to deal with fear, well, fear is is a subjective reality. You know, it may or may not correspond really to what's out there, sure. but it's a real experience. And your fears, the things that you have to stand up and courage to or endure or attack are different than the ones that I have to endure or attack. And then we can go back to, uh, you know, the first the first chapter where he talked about, uh, yeah. he talked about uh, fortitude. He says, uh, to brave to be brave actually means to be able to suffer injury. So it has to do with our vulnerability, that we are actually able to suffer injury. But but then he says, by injury, we understand every assault upon our natural inviolability, every violation of our inner peace, everything that happens to us or is done with us against our will, thus everything in any way negative, everything painful and harmful, everything frightening and oppressive. And I think it's kind of significant that it's by everything frightening right. you know, and oppressive – 
he's saying that, that you know he's he's reiterating something I think is really important for us to realize these days is that that you know whenever we whenever we let, like really fear something doesn't doesn't matter if if the outside world is going to look at it and say we well, don't need to be afraid of that you know it, it we all have thanks. different thanks yeah that's great <laughs> you know that, and honestly that sometime when i was when i was like in college that's what i always felt Stop when it. i was, that's Stop what i was it. always felt like when i would read the bible and i'd say jesus would be say do not be afraid i'm like oh thanks jesus you know it's like uh, and, and i i've come to a better understanding of it but for a while i was like great i now i'm not going to be afraid no you know i was a person who dealt with a lot of fear and anxiety and, and yep. still do in many ways you know but i recognize that you know to a certain extent, one can look on the outside and say, some of these things that you're afraid of, you know, they're not really going to harm you. Why? Mm-hmm. It's an irrational fear of everything. Sure. But as we were talking about earlier, you know, really, if you take into light the the, the reality, the reality of the scripture verse, what is it, what is it, uh, profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you send that to other scripture verses where he says, you know, uh, don't fear the one who can cause you bodily harm, sure. but rather the one who can, you know, can send you to hell, essentially. Yeah. That really any harm apart from moral harm, mm-hmm. apart from harm done to us on a metaphysical level because we have violated the law of God, yeah. any other harm that is done to us is, in a sense, sense subjectively... Uh, our fear of it is going to be subjectively great. Is going to be objectively greater than our subjective experience of that fear. Yeah. We, so, and there, again, yeah. there's a distinction made between harm, which is a more objective reality, metaphysical. Sorry, reality. what I mean is pain. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But but the pain and the fear that's this realm of fortitude that will mm. we're, the reality of our of our human vulnerability is that we always live in a state where we we will be afraid. Mm-hmm. You know, we we encounter these dangers, these threats to our mortality. And fortitude is about standing up to those mm-hmm. and enduring through them and, mm-hmm. and attacking you know, that we'll get to that, but attacking the the evil or, or the barrier that that is standing in our way. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, there's that's a subjective sort of thing there. What scares you is different than what scares me. Mm-hmm. And every person has this own sort of internal battle of of growth and the virtue of courage, facing mm-hmm. their own fears. Mm-hmm. And we read the the bit earlier uh, where people was talking about you know fear of God uh, versus these fear of other like real or unreal fears and it's a really important thing here <laughs> mm-hmm. i've heard people dismiss teddy roosevelt's you know we have nothing to fear but fear itself mm-hmm. and i i can't recall what the dismissal was but certainly in some sense there's something very true about that mm-hmm. because fear of god that's that's the one good holy fear right fear of god casts out fear to, of everything of anything else well and it's someone brought up to, i've been doing information uh in interviews with confirmation students recently, yeah, and uh, and so we've had to talk about the fruits or the the fruits and the gifts of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit. You know, uh, on one one end you have fear of the Lord, and on the other end you have wisdom. And for a while, I was talking with the students like, you know, oh, it's great. God gives us the Holy Spirit gives us all these things, and they're all really good and everything. The last student that I interviewed. I wonder if she'll ever watch this. Last year, and she's like, I thought it was so super interesting. I was talking with my sponsor, and she was talking about how, you know, fear of the Lord is actually the beginning. Like it starts there, and actually, then like the Holy Spirit uh-huh. builds you up. And she brought up Proverbs. Fear of God is the fear of the God is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was like, oh wow, <laughs> like it is like that. I mean, that's the point is that that's where we start. You know, yeah. that's kind of what initially casts out the other fear. But even that, mm-hmm. even that fear is transformed, transmuted, transformed. You know, you surpass that. it. You go yeah. beyond it. Yeah. Um, and, and into you know a, a, a relationship of kind of pure love. Right. You know, eventually with God. Um, and so even that fear, you know, is eventually kind of tossed aside. So that's a, an element to keep in mind as we go more through fortitude, that there, that this is, in some sense, there's a, a, a highly subjective aspect of it. And that doesn't mean, subjective here does not mean unreal. It just no. means it's your own right. private Relating battle. to the subject. <laughs> yes, yeah. relating to the subject. Yeah. You know, so that's an important thing to keep in mind, and that especially as we make it practical, as we go from the level of theory to practice of of, of courage in our lives, it, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not something scares you, Father Peter. Mm. I have my battles to face. I have my things I need to endure. I have uh, my my dragons I need to attack. You know, but that, um, and so we have to discern that, and we have to approach that, and prudently have to take steps of that in our own life. Um. You know, another really neat thing that he brought up in this chapter, I love, he connects the virtue. Yeah, well, so let me back up for a moment. I think we talked a lot about in the beginning uh, with the virtues that one of the things I love about Peeper's presentation of the virtues, drawing from Thomas, 
uh, is that I'd always encountered the virtues as this unsystematic sort of amalgam, you know, this, this pile of these different qualities that were all unsystematic. Mm -hmm. And what we love about the cardinal virtues is we actually begin to see there's a real order here, mm -hmm. you know, prudence proceeding to justice and then fortitude and temperance as these pillars. But also it gives order to the other non-cardinal virtues as sub-virtues. Mm -hmm. And in this in this uh, chapter, he connects patience oh, yeah. as, which it's a virtue we're all familiar with. We've all talked about the patience in, in many ways. Maybe we have a right or wrong idea about it. But we've connected. We, we've had this notion of the virtue of patience, of it being this good quality. But he connects it uh, with the virtue of fortitude, but specifically with the endurance aspect of the virtue of fortitude. Mm -hmm. So the endurance aspect of fortitude, which we've been talking about, is this: you know, to, in the realization of the good, it is the enduring of pain or of evil or of even harm, uh, even real objective harm, to see that the the good is to be done. So, but like a, a deeper level of that, or maybe a deeper specification of uh, endurance is this notion of patience. Now, um, I think it's important. So he, he he begins by trying to... I love how Peter always clarifies the language a little bit. He yeah, says, this is what you may have thought this was. was. <laughs> this is how it's commonly understood. But then he distinguishes uh, it. So he writes about, uh, about patience. Uh, patience, in sharp contrast to the ideas of classic theology, has come to mean today... Uh, oftentimes, an indiscriminate, self-immolating, crabbed, joyless, and spineless su submission to a, whatever evil is met with, mm. or worse, deliberately sought out. Mm -hmm. So that's often how patience is, is thought of, you know, is, is anything but uh, something courageous or brave. It just means just, you know, letting it happen, you know, oh, I just... I it's kind of a with... Buddhist, almost. Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. Well, uh, just in the in the sense that, like, the... the, 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 the uh, in the sense that, from that kind of understanding of patience, it's like the proper, the proper response to any anything of of harm and everything is basically to try to remove one's and any caring about that harm. Right. You know, basically kind of the negation of any sort of feeling or care. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. So he he's contrasting that. that that's maybe maybe that's our impression of, of patience, but um, just like endurance, it's something far more active, something far more um, far more beautiful. Um, the way I like to put it, uh, Teresa and I, have t my, my wife and I have talked about this a lot, this particular virtue, this sub-virtue of fortitude. And the way that I, I think about it myself uh, is that uh, patience is guarding the peace is one way I like to put it. Mm. You know, So we, we, we try to live a good life. We receive the peace that only God can give you know, as, you know, as the result like, mm. you know, of, of living our life in Christ. That's what we're talking about here in the show. Um, that peace of being right with God, of walking humbly with our God, no one can take that away from us. Yeah. Now we can give it up, we can surrender it, you know, but um, that peace of, of heart, that serenity of soul, um, no one can take that from us unless we surrender it. And so it seems like one way to, to, uh, to describe patience is this guarding that peace. Whatever's going on out here, I have to deal with it, but I, I hold on to that place of being in the presence of God um, and, and and holding on to that peace and that knowledge, that wisdom that God is God and he's in control. Mm -hmm. And whatever's going on out here, I don't lose that that serenity. Yeah, it seems like you, you can almost think of it in terms of peace. Peace is something like that um, is, is a little bit like an investment. Um, <laughs> in, and it's like we can... <laughs> On one hand, we have the uh, we have God, and He's the very stable investment, the investment that does not, <laughs> you know, steady two percent all the way, maybe. Um, but but we have like there's so many other things in life that we can kind of invest. Like, okay, I'm gonna place, I'm gonna say like, you know, I'll be at peace inside as long as, as long as this right. continues, you know, as long yeah. as as long as our country is still here, or as long as like you know my family is always like this or as long as i have this much money or as long as i have this house or whatever it's like all right you're gonna place our peace in that Conditional but it's like but whenever like whenever it's it really when it's anything other than god you mm -hmm. know which is always our lot in life that we're going to struggle against that um that whenever we place our peace in something that whenever that thing is put in danger then we feel our peace kind of dwindling you know yeah. being sapped away yeah um and so we, we we always it's a lifelong process of continuously like all right trying to find where we've sort of invested our peace a little bit right and it doesn't mean that we're not gonna doesn't mean that we're not gonna feel fear when these things in our life you know are, are threatened but we can hopefully we through some discernment of spirits we can sort of distinguish in ourselves the difference between peace of soul 
um, and kind of the fear and, and everything. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's the the house built upon solid rock. The the the, the storm still ravages are all around outside, but you know, with Jesus in the butt, you can smile through the storm. So, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, so it always goes back to that, right? You know, it's like, it's, it's, yeah. it's all of just, uh, of, of still finding that peace because it's, it's complete, if it's completely placed in God, the more that we completely place it in God, then, uh, you can't really be touched by any of these harms that happen in our yeah. physical lives. Yeah. I don't, I don't have the quote in front of me, but I, there's a, a part of, um, one of the, one of screw, the screw tape letters, mm. Lewis's screw tape letters, where he, he's talking about, he's looking at you know, some of these d- dynamics as they mm. happen in the heart. Of a, of a person and how oftentimes the temptation is always to to give up your present peace because you're worrying about all these future things you know that oh I, i'm trying to worry about a million future fears future possibilities at once mm-hmm. that could never even all possibly happen when the real duty of the of the christian of the of the person who's trying who's called to be courageous and to to endure is is to endure the present fear Mm-hmm. That's my that's my task today, and, Not, that, and I can't yeah. I can't necessarily escape it. Mm-hmm. I can't necessarily like look ahead and, and plan perfectly and, and eliminate the tension. But it's to endure this present tension, this present fear, mm-hmm. without giving up that peace, without mm-hmm. freaking out and stopping trusting God. Yeah, that's today's task, and and that loops back around to the fact that with all these things, in the end, you know, it's it's not by the strength of man, yes, uh, or it, not not by the power power of man or the strength of soul. But by uh, your grace, O oh Lord, in the words yeah. of Josh Carroll. Uh, um, Josh Carroll's. <laughs> yeah. I love that line. But uh, from Revelator, I'm, I'm not sure which mm. song it is. But, yeah. um, and so because, like, uh, you know, with, with these preparing for, in a sense, mentally or you know, uh, for kind of future things too much, uh, or all the different possible future things. I actually use that that story a lot in spiritual direction with yeah. people. Um, that we we try to, in a sense, we try to stretch our own strength to endure a lot of things that God has not willed for us to endure. Right. Rather than recognizing that the grace of today is sufficient for today, you know, and basically yeah. just saying, all right, this is what God has put in for put for me to uh, endure, and and I know that He has given me the grace to endure it as long as I embrace that grace. That's so uh, interesting. That that that's an interesting dynamic there of prudence and fortitude that. When we're yeah, when we're being anxious about some future or some not not even present thing, something we can't do anything about, something that we just want to ruminate over, that we're trying to endure something that we shouldn't be, mm-hmm. we should be really putting it out of our mind, giving it to God. Like today, I have like I will deal with that. I've written it down. I've made a plan, but now it's there, mm-hmm. and I, today I have this to deal with. Mm-hmm. But sometimes we flee the present and try to endure again a million uh, impossible futures that could never all even occur. Yeah. Uh, and even if they do, even if one of them does, th- we have to trust in this moment. Part of our endurance of fear in this moment is trusting that when I get there, that God will give me the grace to yeah. endure that. Yeah, even when it's something that you know is coming. We've talked right. about this a little bit. Like going, it's like through. when I have a phone call scheduled later in the day. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you too? Okay. Eight phone calls. <laughs> Walking always, around always, like someone's got a knife on me the always whole day. Thinking, I was thinking of that as an example <laughs> earlier of like, you know, quote unquote irrational fears that we have to endure. And I, I was like, phone calls, man. Completely. Ruins Gosh, the whole I don't day. know why. I pace. I pace like when I have phone calls. I just... <laughs> Anyway, but um, yeah. I don't know what it is about phone calls, but gosh, what was I going to say now? We, we've talked about this before, but it's like even when there's futures that you you know are going to happen because it's by your choice. Yeah. You know, and we've been doing this Exodus program and stuff, and it's funny because like every guy that you talk to, they get to at least some point along the lines where all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, I have 70 days left of this or 60 days or whatever the number of days left. 89. There's no way I can endure that. Right. <laughs> you know, and but it's like, yeah. It's always got, comes back to. I always tell him it comes back to. Don't endure sixty nine days today. Mm. Just endure one. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just endure one. Yeah, I'd be thinking about what what God's called us to. You know, he's, he, we know He's called us to be holy. I mean, this whole series is talking about God has called us to be holy as your heavenly Father's holy, mm. to be a saint, to be perfect, uh, to follow in imitation of Christ. Well, again, we have to f- avoid the trap of, of translating that in our mind to trying to imaginatively, in our mind, in our heart, endure it all at once. Yeah. Rather than, no, no, no. That means that today, I, I do the tasks of today. I fulfill the, the justice, the responsibilities of today as courageously as I can. Mm. I don't worry about tomorrow, the next day, or the next day. Yes. You know, today, I try to endure. How do you eat an elephant mushroom? <laughs> Did he really say that? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
one bite all, at a time. It sounds better in that <laughs> voice. Always, you know? And endure. <laughs> okay. uh, Peeper goes on to, so he he told he gave us the the false sense of what patience is. Mm. But he goes on to say, the patient man is not the one who does not flee from evil, but the one who does not allow himself to be made inordinately sorrowful thereby. To be patient means to preserve cheerfulness and serenity of mind in spite of injuries that result from the realization of the good. Patience does not imply the exclusion of energetic forceful activity, but simply explicitly and solely the exclusion of sadness and confusion of heart. Hmm. So again, I love I love patience here because it gives us a, a greater specification of what endurance, what fortitude, <laughs> the what fortitude as endurance looks like. You know, at its height, it means that not just am I enduring this outwardly, but inwardly. You know, uh, what's that? What's that? That hymn? I love that so much. Um, it is well with my soul. Yes, that's yes. what patience that means. It means, mm. you know, regardless of what's going on out there, it is well with my soul. I know there, who's God of the universe. I don't you know, know if they're uh, like I don't know. Maybe it's from a specific uh, like kind of Christian sect, but there are a series of songs that are all kind of on that nature, and they even sound similar. So like, huh. it is well with my soul is one. Be still, my soul. Oh, Another yeah. one. Be still, my soul. The Lord is at thy side. Bear patiently the the cross of uh, uh, something of pains. You know, yeah. I, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but it's just a, a beautiful sentiment that there is that place of of inner peace that we can always hold on to and that can always be there if we actually, well, it, it's a turning towards reality, you yeah. know, as everything kind of ends again, goes, it starts with prudence, yeah. turning towards the reality that if God, well, if God's in the boat, we can smile through the storm. <laughs> Sorry. It's always going to I'm going to have a really that, hard time. When Jesus is in the boat, you can smile through the storm. It is a I'm going to have a hard Bible school song a from back times. when we were Presbyterians, yeah. you know, yeah. before uh, our our family became Catholic. Yeah. yeah. And yet we've been singing forever. And yet so. we've been singing ever since because <laughs> yeah. it's a good song. With it Jesus is. in the boat, you can, can smile, smile through the storm, storm, man. Yeah, maybe it'll be a bonus clip where we sing the whole thing with Complete with hand, with hand motions. Right. He goes on to to uh, to say, uh, patience therefore is not the tear veiled mirror of a broken life, as one might easily assume in the face of what is frequently presented and praised mm-hmm. under this name, but it is rather the radiant embodiment of ultimate integrity. Mm. And then uh, later on, he gives this quote from Aquinas: "Through patience, man possesses his soul." Now it, you know? it's like without kind of reflection, it's a strange. This line, because there's words in there that are used in a certain way that, sure. can, you know, uh, if you just went out, someone said, "What does it mean to possess your soul?" and they'd be like, "Well, demon, sounds weird, <laughs> demon man, <laughs> <laughs> demon person, you know, call Father you know, Peter, take care of that." But you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, but the idea, uh, you know, the the but the word possess is used in a very philosophical way here, yeah. um, because we, I think, we can all like with a little self reflection, we have that sense of kind of giving our way our soul giving away our, mm. our peace you know kind yeah. of giving giving away right. that to, when you yeah. lose your temper right you've you've, yeah. you've let something slip away from yes. you you didn't hold on to yourself you let yourself go mm-hmm. you know we have lots of expressions that that get at this this Absolutely. thing that to I lose be- your patience means rather than holding on to something intact again that integrity rather than remaining intact mm. you've let something slip away Lost and now you have control. to now yeah. you have to recover yourself and probably go say sorry to some people and you know pay for the the hole that you punched in the wall or whatever whatever it happens to be mm. you know absolutely and so because that it, it actually it kind of does come back around to demonic possession in a sense that mm. there is there are times in life when we are tempted either through kind of fear or other things to sort of give up our soul to something, you know, um, you know, not in the sense of being fully possessed, but give because of a fear or because of a, uh, a desire or something, you know, to, to basically kind of give our soul completely over to this thing as a new or to God. an emotion, to passion. Yeah. Yeah. Or to, yeah. A, to a project or to a, a movement. Right. Well, yeah. to enter into a space where we're sort of willing to, we're sort of, whether we acknowledge it or not, willing to sacrifice almost anything for the sake of that right. fear, right. Uh, allaying that fear or rebelling it or trying trying to, whatever we fear losing or fear, uh, fear happening, uh, we're kind of willing, get to a point where we're sort of willing to sacrifice anything for it. And we've given our soul away to that thing, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. no longer in kind of pure, pure, in a pure sense, control of it. But yeah. So with all this, again, we're talking about the endurance aspect of the cardinal virtue of fortitude. And again, it may strike some someone 
um, as slightly odd because I think in popular culture, when we think of fortitude or courage, we're always thinking of the active sense, which we're going to talk about next, you know, on the next episode. Um, but it, it, it's, it is significant that Peeper drawing on Thomas um, uh, points to the endurance aspect being the more essential aspect precisely because um, it does, um, well, there's, there's a number of reasons for it there. Uh, and, but we, I think we see in, in patients this specification, this deeper specification of it's through that endurance aspect that you hold, you're, you hold on to yourself. You, um, you remain, you, you keep that integrity of, of your soul. I, I think he's got a nice line here on 130, and, yeah. and he points to why he thinks of it as very, as more um, kind of essential yeah. to endurance. And it's because, as he says, power is so manifestly, uh, manifestly of the very structure of the world that endurance, not wrathful attack, is ultimately the decisive test of actual fortitude, mm. which essentially is nothing else than to love and to realize that which is good in the face of injury or death. And undeterred by any spirit of compromise, undeterred by any spirit of compromise, I think is a huge, huge thing there. But it's it's like why is it why is it more manifest or why why is it more integral in a sense or essential of uh, fortitude? Uh, why why is endurance more essential of fortitude rather than a kind of attack? It's because there's something about you know the nature of the combat of of the things of this quote unquote world, mm -hmm. you know, which when we say the world of flesh and the devil, we're not necessarily saying that the world in itself is bad, but we're saying about kind of the fullness of the world that, uh, that it is more, uh, more natural to our fallen state to want to, uh, attack and gain control over, you know, the thing, uh, thing that it feels threatening, right. you know, rather than to endure, which, by itself, because in a sense it's more contrary to the natural tendency of the world, uh, is a bit more of an essential nature to it when it yeah. comes to uh, fortitude. Well, and I can I think it's and this is something we'll talk about next time. But it is the man who can endure. Hmm. It is the man who is patient. That's the man who then can know in prudence when and how to attack. Mm -hmm. You know, when is there a dragon that needs slaying? Or when is there an obstacle that you just have to put your shoulder against and, and push? Mm -hmm. You know, we we tend to always because we're we're passionate, kind of fragmented beings. We tend to default to the attack, you know, uh, either irrationally, uh, just in terms of our, of a reaction, you know, to something, or, or even calculatedly out of fear that like we need to you know, strike first, kind of a thing. But the person again who's able to decisively, incisively take action to go out of himself to a, attack it, to pounce on an evil as 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 he will say uh, it's the person who can be patient the person mm -hmm. who, can, who can who who can endure and therefore again i think an important aspect of patience too is it protects prudence mm -hmm. that whatever you're experiencing you're able to remain a person of reason you don't mm -hmm. give way to passion you don't give way to fear or anger or any, any other emotion you remain prudent so that you can decide what's the right way to respond here What's good for the other person in this situation? What is what will give glory to God in the situation? I'm not letting myself slip back into a self-referential sense of justice. No, what's true justice in the situation? What's the true good? So yeah, in one sense, there's there's a, uh, a procession of endurance to attack yeah. in the virtue of fortitude, uh, where you one must endure first in order to maintain the preeminence of reason and of prudence, uh, uh, or reasonable prudence, I should say, which is prudence, yeah. that's just what it is, in order to be able to be clear about what is the just, what is just and good, mm -hmm. and therefore to then attack there. But um, we can't lose sight of the fact that there there are many times when endurance is kind of the sum total of what we're able to do. And because of that, I, and, and he, he mentions that specifically, and I actually kind of wrote a, a quote in my book, uh, or a little little note in my book here, mm -hmm. I said, when I was talking about endurance uh, of the, he says, uh, because the world as it is constituted, it is only in the supreme test, which leaves no other possibility of resistance than endurance, that the inmost and deepest strength of man is, is self-revealed. You know, um, it's in those, specifically in those situations when there's literally nothing else to do but endure. endure. You know, there is no resistance possible. And we see that you know, especially in the uh, in the martyrs, yeah. you know, where there is no attack to be had for them. You know, they, most of the time they're facing just overwhelming. They, there's no ability for them to have mm -hmm. any sort of possibility, and and so simply to 
you know, to attack in any sort of sense um, would just be completely futile. Mm -hmm. And so their their goodness resides in simply enduring and resisting any uh, any any uh, attack or uh, compromisation of their moral of their moral integrity in those situations. And I wrote my book as like my my kind of <laughs> my sort of note to myself was this is the type of courage that is so hard for men in particular. Because it is only available in the face of no external control. And we desire control so much in our external surroundings, yeah. you know. I mean, it it would seem it would seem like it's so much easier for a man uh to be given you know, a man with a you know, decently good constitution, um, to want to be able to defend his family. You know, to be given the opportunity to actually say, no, it is just for me to defend my family mm-hmm. right now. But, in, you know, but there being situations where there's actually just no possibility of resistance. We can't really think of it. I can't think of an example right now. Mm-hmm. There's no possibility of an existence uh, of resistance where he simply has to uh, endure. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's it's like, you know, I, all right, giving you a choice. You know, a yeah. person has a knife to your wife's neck i mean awful situations to think about a person has a knife your wife's knife is like unless you press that button that sends a nuclear bomb into new right, york right. you know i mean there's, there's well, all or even things. just like a job situation yeah. where the calamity has already happened sure and then you're left with this question of do i endure the silence from god hmm. like i do i continue to trust and, and endure this this sadness this pain or do i give in and go nihilistic and, and right. despair and rage against god you know that the endurance of those. Again, there's nothing I can do. I can't. I can't fix it, and I can't understand it. I simply have to hold fast for now. Mm. You know, um, like that's. I just remember the line that I was forgetting from that song. Yes, be soul, my soul. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Be, what is it? I think it's the bear patiently the bear cross patiently of grief, the cross or, of pain. grief or pain. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. I probably someone's probably going to comment on it. You're completely wrong. <laughs> you don't but, know your hymn knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was thinking about that. Yeah, it's like yeah, that's the bearing patiently grief. <laughs> you know. There's, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I wanted to to end this episode by talking about practicals, but man, we've talked too long. So I think what we'll uh, do is we'll we'll hold off till next time. We'll round out this discussion talking about the attack aspect of fortitude. We'll contrast that with the endurance, see how they interface. And then we'll talk more practically about, well, in terms of our our daily examine, in terms of our plan of life, in terms of dealing with situations in life, how can we think more practically and concretely about this virtue um, uh, so that we can uh, take steps to try to grow in it. And do it, Master Wayne. And do it, (laughs) Master Wayne. Hey everyone, I I hope you enjoyed our discussion on fortitude this week and that you've been enjoying this conversation about the cardinal virtues that we've been having here on Deep in Christ. You know, endurance is such an important aspect of the Christian life. So many scriptures come to mind, but in particular, uh, St. Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. Through the grace we have been given by faith, we must walk courageously our Christian life, not being caught off guard by difficulty or the presence of evil, but rather being ready, ready to bear it with patient endurance out of love of Jesus and by his power, not our own. Our Lord states in the Gospel of Matthew, he who endures to the end will be saved. And James echoes this, blessed is the man who endures trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. We'll be back next week to dig more into the virtue of fortitude, particularly when we are called to take decisive action, this active aspect, to move on an obstacle or to challenge an injustice. For now, though, thanks for watching or listening. Be sure to like and subscribe so that you're notified of new episodes of this and other programs for the Coming Home Network International. And as always, especially if you yourself are someone looking to better understand the Catholic Church, or perhaps you have or are considering becoming or returning to Catholicism, the Coming Home Network is your network. Visit us at chnetwork.org to hear testimonies, get helpful resources, and most importantly, find fellowship with others on a similar journey to yours. 
with just a few clicks, join our online community where you can continue to follow, discuss, and participate in this show with other members of the Coming Home Network. With that, thanks again for joining me for this episode of Deep in Christ. I'll talk to you next week. God bless. Thank you.